Awesome. And welcome to the Winter Garden Yoga podcast. My name is Brian. I'm the co-owner and the co-director of Winter Garden Yoga. And today we've got a really great guest. Her name is Michelle Stobart. She's the owner and operator of Inhale Yoga in Athens, Ohio. We go back a whole bunch of years. We're really good friends. We share a lot of things in common when it comes to teaching yoga. I don't want to give too much away. So Michelle, if you will, can you take about three to five minutes to tell the people who you are, where you're from, et cetera, et cetera? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks, Brian, for inviting me to this podcast to get to spend some time and chat with you about my huge love of yoga and, and meditation and the path of this practice. Awesome. Uh, as Brian said, my name is Michelle Stobart. I am the owner and operator of Inhale Yoga Studio here in Athens, Ohio. Um, I have been on this path for a long time. <laughs> uh, I started actually practicing yoga in 1997 uh, as a way to get some exercise, as a way to um, kind of see what people were talking about um, when they said yoga and the spirituality of it and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then around 2003, I decided to go into a teacher training program and learn to teach this stuff. So uh, my path over the years was a practitioner starting in 97, predominantly in uh, kind of a, a hot, hot the start of books and DVDs um, where I live and definitely at that time was uh, a small community where they didn't even know what yoga was. So mm -hmm. I had to go out to get books and DVDs for that to happen. Eventually I landed myself in the Ashtanga yoga style um, you know, the primary series and, and all of that. And that's what I did my training in with a teacher who was um, uh, a Patabi Joyce um, devotee and, um, and sanctioned teacher. And, um, you know, I, I loved it for a really long time, probably for the reason everybody who does Ashtanga loves it. Mm -hmm. um, it was fantastic. I loved the discipline. I loved the strength. I loved the focus and concentration. Um, but after a while, what I started to realize was that I didn't love the way my shoulders hurt all the right. time when I did practice. And so I started to feel like, okay, there's a bit of rigidity in this practice. Maybe I need something that's a little bit more fluid, right? So I moved out of the Ashtanga practice and into a more vinyasa style practice. Um, and I was still really pretty young in my yoga practice. So for me, I feel like when you're really young in your yoga practice, all those cool tricks really like get your juices flowing, right? So I went down the lane then of those cool tricks. The flow and the vinyasa, my body started feeling so much better. Then I started getting into the tricks and here we are again. My shoulders are hurting and on top of that, now my lower back is hurting all the time too. Mm -hmm. So it started to make me question a lot. Um, if this yoga thing is supposed to be healing, what is it about this yoga thing that I must be doing wrong because I feel good on the inside but my body suffers every time I do this practice. Right. And that led me into, you know, really exploring this idea of yoga as a therapeutic practice. And, you know, I've kind of been going through that exploration and the deepening of that exploration uh, since, I don't know, around 2007. So it's been a long path for me, not just something I've jumped on recently because it's the thing to do now. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think there is really something there to a way that we can use yoga as a therapeutic practice to keep the body in balance from everything that we do in life. And we can still, through other components of yoga, not just the asana, find that link to what we can call the more spiritual side. You know, the way that we use the breath as a focus point to become quieter in the mind and connect to that quieter space. And it doesn't necessarily involve having to be a bunch of tricks all slung together. 
that might be good for some people, but for me, my experience has been that my body says, when you do this, nothing gets achieved. You take steps backwards. Right. So that's kind of been my, that's been my path, you know, starting out in Ashtanga, moving into Vinyasa, noticing the various injuries that come and then inquiring, how can this be a more healing path? Um, if this is what I want to be my long-term, um, my long-term intention. Got you. And it's funny because listening to your story, it's almost identical to mine. And I'll just share a little something and maybe you can relate to it or maybe not. Part of my frustration is, uh, you know, so I'm doing, I'm doing all the cool stuff too. I'm doing the levitations and the handstands and whatnot. My shoulders are killing me. My low back is, is killing me also. What was a little frustrating for me was if I would speak to a teacher or I'd even speak to other yoga students and I would ask them about, you know, what, what's going on with my shoulders or what's going on with my wrists, the answer would inevitably be do more yoga, <laughs> right? It's like you, your shoulders just haven't adapted yet or your wrists will eventually get stronger. And just like you, uh, it took, I had to take a couple steps back and I would think it through. I'd be like, well, hold on. If yoga is supposed to help my shoulders, how is it hurting my shoulders and how is doing more of it going to help my shoulders, even though it's hurting my shoulders. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So what was, how did you kind of break the cycle? I know you said that you got into a more therapeutic approach, but how did, how did you break the cycle of um, shoulders hurting to, and getting into like more of a healing modality? Well, it was, um, it was the way I approached the practice then. So one, first and foremost, I knew that the more advanced postures that I did, the more pain that I incurred, right? So the first thing I did, cut all advanced yoga postures. Mm -hmm. Headstands, shoulder stands, arm balances, crazy twisting arm balance levitations, all that stuff just came off right off the bat because I knew that that was a very complicated way to move my body. And typically when I went out of those poses, I immediately knew I did something wrong. So I started there and then that led me to go back to the foundations, mm -hmm. right? And so where is it then in the foundations that things are going apart or falling apart? So this wasn't just a personal exploration though. Right around 2011, 2012, I started studying with my therapeutic wisdom of yoga teacher, Doug Keller. And through my work with him, my studies with him, I began to learn and understand more about the proper mechanics of how the body works, how, you know, one muscle engaging lets the other muscle relax. And instead of laying into the ligaments or pulling the muscles to their fullest stretch capacity, that bringing the balance of creating a strength and a stability and then moving into the capable range of motion from that strength and stability, the more I did that in my practice, the more I understood that in my education, the more my body started to feel better when I went into this practice, and the more that I could use the practice to recover from other things I love, like paddle boarding and hiking and you know, just like being in an active lifestyle, I can use this as a way to balance the way my body works through all the various phases of who I am as a human. I got you. It's very interesting um, because I've always felt that's, well, really that's even why I got into yoga in the first place was as sort of a, a healing modality. And I think a lot of folks get misconstrued. They think that yoga is like a killer workout. Um, yeah. And if, 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 some, if some folks would just kind of think a little bit about like what life was like in India a hundred years or so ago, they would probably understand that most people didn't need a killer workout back then. Like life was pretty tough. You know, yeah. um, you're walking a lot, I'm sure. There's probably a lot of manual labor involved. 
just to get water, uh, just to go to the market and stuff. And I believe yoga would be used to kind of try to heal you, like bend you back into the right place, get your shoulders back in the shoulder girdle, breathe, center your mind to help overcome all that stuff. And somehow, uh, just through evolution and whatnot, yoga's got this, uh, most yoga methods have this idea that it's a killer workout. Let's turn the temperature of the room up really high and let's get together and suffer for about 90 minutes and do it again tomorrow, right? Which is what I think is so funny because especially if you're looking at the texts, um, you know, like the spiritual texts of the yoga tradition, it's all about finding a way that we move out of suffering. Right. Right. And so moving into these practices where it's hot, it's super flowy, you're doing all this really hard stuff, like you're just inspiring more suffering. <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it's always been so funny to me to think about, like, if this is to, meant to alleviate suffering, why do we induce suffering? <laughs> right. That's why I've always recommended to anyone who will listen, but in particular to uh, our clients at Winter Garden Yoga, is... Uh, it's a paraphrase from a guy called Pavel Satsulin. I'm paraphrasing it, but it's let a spoon be a spoon, let a fork be a fork, let a knife be a knife, right? So you wouldn't use a knife to eat breakfast cereal and you wouldn't use a spoon to cut your steak. So let yoga do what it's supposed to do. If you run, let running do what running is supposed to do or walking, whatever. And if you're strength training, let strength training do what it's supposed to do. Let each thing kind of do its own thing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. agree with that? Yeah, sure. Um, and, you know, like I see all of those different things. Ha I mean, that's why I love to paddle and hike and walk because right. yoga can't give me the kind of thing that paddling can. Right. You know, paddling can't give me the thing that, walking or hiking in the the hills around you know ohio can give me and and so those things you know when we think about or at least for me and what i hope that my clients take away too is that when we think about yoga it should be one part of the whole right i remember one right. time you were here offering a workshop and you had done this triangle and you were talking about so much goes into one portion, so much goes into another portion. And then when things start to feel out of balance, you renegotiate those numbers again. Right. And that's how I think about all of life, right? If you, if you are a person who works at a desk and you're spending 80% of your day working at a desk, which has its own particular postural and muscular imbalances, then the next thing you need to do is go, what's the opposite of that? Which isn't hop in the car, go home and sit on the couch in the same posture and then go get in bed and sleep in the same posture, right? And so I, I think about that a lot and talk to my clients about that a lot is what, is what is the overall makeup of your day? What is the thing you spend the most of your time doing and what is the shape you take when you do that? Now, what are the things you can do to help balance that? in your yoga. If you're not, if you're not doing anything for your heart, maybe you go take a brisk walk, right? And so what are the things, how do you organize that triangle so that you're finding the balance in all the aspects of your life? Gotcha. That's awesome. Now, may I ask, are you okay with revealing how old you are? Sure. How old are you? I am 43. 43. Actually, I just 43 in June. That's right. Happy belated birthday. Okay. <laughs> so if you were to speak to your 23 year old self, Oh my. <laughs> and if your 23 year old self would have listened, what three things would you tell your 23 year old self to consider when practicing yoga, thinking about yoga so that you could, practice for the rest of your life, right? Because you, you and I both know, we don't have to mention names and stuff like that, and it's okay, but we know that there are some real, there's some busted up yoga teachers who like, they don't even practice anymore. They may have been like, 
you know, really popular or prominent figures X amount of years ago, you don't see them practicing anymore because they're so busted up because maybe they didn't find a therapeutic way of practicing, etc. So what are three things to consider to kind of avoid being too busted up and that you can enjoy yoga for the rest of your life? Okay. Well, this is a tough one. Uh, <laughs> only three. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's start with three. So we know one is uh, back off a little bit and make it. Yeah, absolutely. I would say, I would say the first one is, and it's the, I think it's the hardest one, but I would say the first one is try not to get too enamored with the glittery tricks. Right. I would say that would be the first one. Okay. Um, and then the second thing would be to slow down and move with intention. Um, and then the third one would be if it is somehow your feels like your purpose, your goal in life to do the tricks, then slow down, move with intention, and be really specific about what your body needs to be capable of and how to stabilize and support in order for the glimmer to happen without injury. Okay. So you know, I tell people, if you wanna do the tricks, awesome. Do the tricks, but do the tricks knowing how to do them and where you're not ready for them. That's the slow down. Slow down, pay attention, build the stability that you need, and then move forward. Okay. So the first one is funny because your first one's don't do the glittery tricks. That's right. Just take so that off the table for a while. Why? Why don't? Well, yeah, because why? one, when you're first starting a yoga practice or if you're young, even if you're old, mostly it's that, that new mentality, that new mindset of starting something, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And the things that you don't know are the things that get you injured. And so taking that glittery stuff off the table is going to be really, really hard for your mind. It's going to be a really good practice actually but it's gonna be really hard for your mind because as a new student, to you, that is yoga. The more you can achieve and move in the direction of those advanced things, you must be really good at this. But again, as you and I know from our practice, probably very much in that mentality, is what you get is not necessarily an accumulation of postures that are good for press photos, but an accumulation of injuries that you're just struggling through for those right. Instagram shots. Yeah. Right? Well, we didn't have Instagram back in the day. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we had a pterodactyl that would uh, <laughs> carve things on a marble plate and carry it through the air. Yeah, um, that's right. <laughs> one quote that I think about, so two things that I think about with the glittery poses. One is a quote from Doug Swinson's book. It's called Pioneering vinyasa i'm paraphrasing and i hope i don't get it like too messed up i'm paraphrasing doug's quote he said he used to look at the yoga postures as something to conquer it was like okay there's that pose i've got to conquer it i'm going to win and then he would conquer the pose and then look for the next pose to conquer and then eventually as he got older and i presume wiser he realized that it was just it was not a matter about like conquering things, but just kind of hanging out, being comfortable, and enjoying the, the company of the postures. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, that's great. And the other thing I think of is risk to benefit. This is something, uh, this, this may happen to you too at your yoga studio, but sometimes we'll have folks who come to Winter Garden Yoga, and they'll go through an intermediate class and they'll kind of wait around by the laptop and you know wait till everyone leaves and then they'll ask me kind of confidentially do you guys do advanced poses here and what i try to explain to them is you know advanced is here 
-hmm. And it's also about risk to benefit. So high risk might be, let's say, headstand. It's a high risk and low benefit uh, when you think about what you get out of headstand Mm -hmm. versus maybe, depending on everything, downward dog. It's got a low risk and you get just about as much benefit as handstand, right? You get the shoulder stability, strengthen your arms, you get a mild inversion, but you don't have to worry about hyperextending your wrists, hypermobilizing your low, low back or landing on your skull, right? Uh-huh. So I think of that in context of like a glittery pose and a non-glittery pose. Does that make sense? To you? Yeah, absolutely. And even you saying that, you brought that to a training at some point when you were here at Inhale, and you had brought that up in the teaching that you were giving. And I've taken that on one in my own like practice and teaching what I'm teaching to my students. But I lead the teacher training program, as you know, because you've been here to work in it. Yeah. Um, but that's what I tell my teachers in training you're choosing poses that have a higher benefit and a lower risk, right? So what if your student is excited about a headstand, is it because they want the glittery pose or is it the inversion quality of that that makes them excited? Because we can give them the benefit of that inversion without the risk to the whole body, to the whole system of that headstand, especially if they're new, especially if they have low awareness of their body um, and its mechanics, especially if they don't have a balanced strength. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from a, from a therapeutic yoga standpoint, I see in my classes, I see most of my clients, students after work, right? They're there at six o'clock in the evening. So for me to ask them to do a headstand would be really irresponsible of me as a teacher, because if you think about the shape of the body and the way the muscles have been imbalanced throughout the day, there is no way in a one hour class that I can bring the balance to that to get them into a place to go into that pose safely. Mm -hmm. So why not give them something that gives them better benefit and decreases the risk. Yeah, it's not glittery, and yeah, it's not a trick, and yeah, you can't post on your Instagram that you did (laughs) this thing, but what you also won't be posting on your Instagram is a picture of you in the chiropractor's office or having a neck surgery or, you know, all the other things that could happen because of the risk involved for that pose. Do you think there's a difference between being a teacher and being an instructor? Um, well, I guess to me, there is, um, I feel like an instructor is somebody who calls out the commands of something to do, put your foot here, raise your arm there, breathe in here, whatever. A teacher is someone who calls out those instructions, of course, but also, um, explains to you or helps you understand the relevance of those and how to bring that into a more right. holistic approach in your body. And they are revealing truths about you that have always been there, but you haven't turned your attention to. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, it does. It's, um, it's just, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, answer to me. And here's, here's kind of where, where I'm going, where I'm, what I'm getting at is because sometimes because I'm well, first of all, I'm hearing the way you speak. I'm like, this is why I like Michelle Stobart because it's <laughs> you know, I can I totally relate to what you're saying and I appreciate what you're saying. And I think about when students ask me, they'll say like, oh, uh, I'm going to be in Bug Tussle, Kentucky. Can you recommend a studio? And it's like I can't because I don't know. I don't know how they, I don't know how they teach. I don't know what their approach is. I don't know if it's a bunch of instructors who are just kind of repeating what they've heard or if it's Mm -hmm. truly a bunch of teachers who can explain like the why behind everything. And I will explain to my clients, I said like, now, if you do find a yoga studio in your travels, you need to ask the, the teacher or the instructor questions 
and this is going to help you know if they're qualified. And I said, there are some, I said, there's only, there are only about a handful of teachers that I physically know that meet this criteria. Michelle Stobart is one of them. If you ask a yoga teacher or yoga instructor, why do we put our hand like this in downward dog? The qualified teacher is going to say, well, we put our hand there because of this, 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 and this, and it's a kinetic chain from the hand to the elbow to the shoulder, and that's what depresses the scapula and et cetera, et cetera. They're going to give you notes and you should write some stuff down. The unqualified teacher, regardless of how many certificates they have and their length of credentials, they're going to say something like, I don't know. I was just told to put, so-and-so told me to put my hand that way. So I teach it that way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a filter or like a criteria type filter that you share with your students and your clients? Like if, God forbid, they go to a different yoga studio? <laughs> well, one of the things that I say, um, that I remind my students, because I, when I'm working with my students, I am less concerned about the shape their body makes in mm -hmm. a pose and more concerned about, are they paying attention? Is their body active, strong, and supportive? And do they feel uh, no pain, right? The muscles can be working and it's uncomfortable, whatever, do they feel no pain? Right. So one of the things that I say to them when they go to another studio though, is remember what we've done here. And if somebody asks you to do it differently and you know that causes you pain, you're responsible to do it the way that's right for you. If the teacher insists, you should roll up your mat and leave. Right, right. Because no teacher should insist that you do it their way. You might be open to exploring it a new way if you haven't found a way that makes you feel peaceful. But if you've already found the way that makes you feel peaceful, and like you said, if they, if you ask the question, if they say, well, I want your hips to be rolled like this in this pose, and you say, I think that causes me pain, why? And they just say, because that's the alignment of the hips, roll up your mat and yeah. leave. <laughs> because the answer is something very different. Right. That's very <laughs> I'm curious because this is, this has happened to, I'm sorry, you go. Well, I was going to say, yeah. um, back to the teacher instructor thing, I think that's a huge difference between teacher and instructor, too. A teacher helps you find the poses it's meant to live in your body, and instructor imposes their will about the pose on you. Got you. And, you know, like, because it's what they were taught, not necessarily what well, works best for you. Got you. Yeah. Now, I'm curious. This happens to this happens to me is like, uh, I'm curious if it happens to you also. I'll have a student who's come back to Winter Garden Yoga and they'll ask me, do you know so-and-so who runs this studio here and there? And I'll say, yeah, we're, we're friends. Why do you ask? Well, because they came right over to me and said, you're one of Brian Friedman's students, aren't you? <laughs> Because there was some, you know, there's some kind of alignment principle or something where they wouldn't go super deep into the pose. So I'm curious, has that happened to you? Uh, if it does happen to me, it happens. Um, I am kind of an anti standing full forward bend. I'm a half forward bender. Right. And so I think that's kind of my, um, that's kind of my like, signature thing of sorts so uh if it happens somebody from my studio has gone somewhere else and only gone halfway and, the, right. and they've baffled me. So why won't they go with me further right right <laughs> but i do have students go to other classes and come back and say they had us doing it this way yeah. you've cautioned us against that way and I didn't know what to do. And I go, well, what did you do? Well, I did it your way. And I'm like, I think you chose the right path. <laughs> yeah. It's just really, it's kind of a fine balance. It just make sure it doesn't hurt 
exactly. I, just, I just try to say that to my clients is like, don't disrespect the teacher or the class and stuff. It's, but don't ever put yourself into pain. Skip the pose altogether with all due respect and just try to get through the practice safely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or so the second one, second bullet point you mentioned was go slowly. So you mentioned no glitter poses. Try to focus more on benefit, not so much risk, but focus on benefit. Look for poses that you can get similar or you know equal to or greater than results with a lot less risk. Yeah. Second bullet point was go slow. What does that mean? Tell me more about that. Yeah, well, so going slow, first of all, going slow automatically sets an intention of mindfulness and awareness, right? You're not just going to slam into the pose at some place or destination within your body that you've already arrived at. You actually use the pose to understand who you are and what you are right in this moment. So there's a, a mindfulness and awareness quality to it. On top of that, if you go slow, then you get to have those micro responses from your body about this isn't working or, oh gosh, there's a twinge here. We skip over those and just power through those generally. Right. So moving slow gives us the opportunity to see where we fall into our habitual patterns of recruitment and derailment to just get to the pose um, versus where can we bring more stabilization and range of motion to the parts of our body that are weak or not working in conjunction with everything else the way that it should. So for me, in my personal practice and also my teaching, you know, we take the time to feel the way that the big toe and the outer heel work together, to mm -hmm. feel what happens if you bend or hyperextend the knee, to feel what happens if you shift the weight this way or that way. And then it gives us a whole lot of information about our own body so that we can be more in balance and more in alignment. And what I find personally when you go slow is you achieve a greater range of motion faster and the body is more secure and stable right. than if you just take triangle pose, for example, mm -hmm. if you go into triangle pose and your goal is to put your hands on the floor and you just like power through that, no doubt your hips are going to shift backwards because your hamstrings and outer hips are tight. Your core is going to stop working. And so your pelvis is going to tilt in a weird way. Then you're going to compensate for that by over back bending the chest and cranking the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing feels really uncomfortable. And you couldn't really stay there for lots and lots of breaths if you were asked of it. Versus if you take it slow, engage and stabilize, and then move through the range of motion with that engagement and stability, you may not get as far, you may not touch the floor, right. but over time, as you use that stability and engagement, your range of motion grows because everything is working in balance and you get to that point, perhaps if your anatomy allows it. We haven't even talked about how the bones get in the way because of the way they compress with other right. bones, et cetera. But you know, just because we see a pose a certain way in a magazine or on Instagram or because the person that's on the mat beside of us, that doesn't mean that that pose will work that way in our body. So right. going slow helps you find what is the truth about you and this pose? What is the conversation that you and this pose have with each other on this moment in in this class on your mat, that conversation is different every time. Right. Yeah. Even 20 minutes or 20 seconds ago is going to be different than what's yeah. happening in this moment. It's funny because uh, one sort of ninja trick that I teach my teachers who are about to teach, I said, watch how quickly people get into and out of poses. If people are go if if it takes someone 
less than five seconds to get into triangle pose, chances are they're not doing it correctly. Mm -hmm. And if, it, if they pop right out of triangle pose, chances are they're not doing it correctly. And it's really just the biomechanical uh, side effect of loading the muscles mm -hmm. and unloading the muscles. You know, the muscles are just like big, I don't know, springs or big rubber bands. So you gotta like, it's hard to pull a rubber band enough to leverage the, the joints and stuff like that correctly. And so it'll, to come up is also requires a certain amount of effort and leverage too. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, you just said something that made me go, oh, the way you come out of the <laughs> Yeah. That's huge. You know, yeah. I, think, I think there's a great emphasis on teaching teachers um, how to cue people into the pose. Right. And not as much emphasis on coming out. Correct. And, like, I think a lot of research is showing that the majority of yoga injuries are happening not as you go into the pose. But as you come out of the pose, because you often, it's not cued for those same engagements to get you Correct. out. Yeah. It's just you take a breath and come up out of this thing. Correct. Right? And that's and the so thing I is. Think there, no, you go. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, I think there's really something there. And it's equally as important to put that focus for the student, to put that focus in their own body of those engagements, getting into it engagements while holding it correct this while coming out correct correct and that's that's what that's what we emphasize is um i and it's a true story I, I tell my students two songs go in my head every time i do any yoga pose so here's like a little insider secret uh when when i go into a pose whether it's triangle or whatever in my head i hear we've only just begun by the carpenters mm -hmm. because it reminds me we're just getting started yes and then once i'm into it from jermaine jackson let's get serious kicks mm -hmm. in because now it's time to get serious you've gotten there this doesn't mean it's time to relax and wait for michelle to stop talking yeah. so you can kind of fling yourself out of the pose it's like you're in the pose now get serious now find those uh, muscles to tighten, the core stability, et cetera, so that you can come out of the pose the same way you went into the pose. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so now yeah. we've got get rid of the glitter poses, go slow. If you're going to do the glitter poses, do it as, in a safe, progressive way. Is that correct? Yeah. So talk, yeah, so talk me take, through that. Take all the things you've learned from going slow and apply them as you approach glitter, right? So for instance, a seated twist. So you learn all the things about spinal extension, rotation, moving up and out, et cetera. Okay, great, so now you got that. If you're then going to take an advanced pose, which is an advanced twist, um, say like maybe that cricket pose, is that what it's called? Where you- Grasshopper. Yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's a huge twist in that, right? So, and that's where the sacroiliac joint gets really unstable. And so what are the things you learned from the foundation work of the up and around and how do you keep that and apply that into this glittery pose now so that you're still holding the same intention as if your seat was on the ground rather than your seat's floating over the ground now? Right. And how, you know, if you're going to approach the glitter, it has to be from a place of that same intentionality, that same mindfulness so that everything stays stable and strong and you move within the range of motion. And that might mean that a pose like that grasshopper pose is, you know, a three year endeavor to find how those various pieces, I mean, cause there's a, a giant hip opener in that, mm -hmm. there's the arm stability in that, there's the 
the chest openness piece of that, the twist. There's so many components of mm -hmm. it. And so really refining those components through that slow intentional practice of the foundations and then not going, oh, I know what I'm doing and just slam into it, but do the same thing. Find that same intentionality to bring that pose to life and, you know, apply your songs. <laughs> <laughs> You've only just begun. Let's get serious. <laughs> <laughs> apply that into it. And, and so it's not that moment. I think too with poses, we think there's a, um, okay, here I am. I've achieved the pose. Like I'm in triangle. And then we just forget about it, right? We go, what's the next thing now? What's after triangle? And that like, let's get serious is, is really the missing component. Like I'm in triangle. It's not about what's next because what's next is how can I stay stable and strong? Right and really drop into the journey of this pose and be ready for when it's time to come out of it rather than just go, I did triangle, got the picture. Right. Now what's next? Right. So yeah. in a way, it kind of goes back to your second bullet point is go slow. So if, if you're going to do the glitter stuff, give it time, go slow. Yeah. Um, you know, it's something you and I have talked about is like the regression. Like sometimes you have to, not sometimes, like all the time, you have to take a few steps back before you can take a step forward. Yeah. Right. It's something, um, it's something that I talk about too, is like taking the path of most resistance, which is what you were talking about a little while ago is sometimes the habit is move, Oh, I feel stuck. Now I'll bypass it mm -hmm. because it's easier and I can get my hand to the ground. No, follow the path of most resistance. Yeah. Because that's like telling you, okay, here's where you need to work. Here's where you might be unstable. Here's where this muscle isn't contracting to let this muscle go in order to find stability, etc. So by finding the path of most resistance. You're good. I believe that's where you're going to extract the most gold and it may take longer, but it's, you're going to be that much better and it may not take longer because you're less likely to become injured, right? Yes. Nothing sidelines you quicker than being injured going too fast, too soon, right? Absolutely. So really like the fastest way to get some way to, to get somewhere is to, go slow right yeah it's the tortoise and hair prospect you know yeah. like the hair can get there really really fast um and then stops and goes oh hey i'll just take a break because i'm so far ahead of the game but the tortoise and the slow progress wins the race eventually right you know and and it's that like just slow it down be attentive be aware what's the what's the hurry you know like right. Maybe you're lucky enough to get tomorrow to do it again, um, and hopefully you are, but even still, like, uh, I think maybe we were talking before we started doing this podcast, um, you know, the, the adventure is, is the great part of it, right? The, once you achieve something and you conquer it, right. so to speak, like, the fun kind of deflates out of people. and so how can we how can we really allow ourselves to not think i'm trying to conquer my body i'm trying to conquer these poses or that somehow in conquering and achieving i will somehow be much more enlightened or better at my life because of it instead how can we go this is this is something that makes me feel good that makes my body feel stable strong and secure uh, and then I enjoy doing and can sustain from my 20 year old self to my 40 year old self to my 60 year old self right. because I haven't had to have a rotator cuff surgery right. of, from all the chaturangas or something, you know, right. we should do, um, we should have a hashtag. What's the hurry. I like yeah. that. Love it. <laughs> well, because really, What's the hurry? I mean, there's, you're not going to get a, 
a gold cup at the end of class or at the end of the month because you've, I don't know, uh, conquered something. Yeah. What's the hurry. Just enjoy the process. And it's easy for the 50 year old me to say that, right? Because I've kind of gone through, I've gone through the injuries and all that stuff. Uh, and it was even something yeah. David Swinson talked about. David Swinson, you know, he stood in front of about 300 people and he was trying to explain like the, advanced stuff doesn't matter. And he would say, well, then the students will say, well, that's easy for you to remark because you can do the advanced stuff. And he'd say, it wouldn't matter even if I couldn't do the advanced stuff, then the students would reply, well, you can't do the advanced stuff, so how do you know what matters and what doesn't, right? It's kind of like a losing proposition mm -hmm. on either end of that spectrum. Yeah. But right in the middle is just enjoy the process and just mm -hmm. hang out and, and enjoy the poses. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, awesome. the, it's the whole reason, right? Or at least it, from my experience, the whole right. reason that I'm doing the practice is because it makes me feel better on the inside, <laughs> right. right? So no matter what I do to my body, like I could sit, I can do a restorative practice and it makes me feel good on the inside. I can do a movement based practice and it makes me feel good on the inside and I want to cultivate more of that I tell my students like I'm the laziest yogi in the whole world <laughs> the way to do it laying down with support I'm in right. <laughs> you know like if I can find a way to get the benefits from the pose and just decrease that risk even more and right. increase the feel good more like I am constantly on the search for the the not necessarily easiest because it certainly <laughs> isn't easy right. to use props and, and hold yourself that accountable um but looking for that way that effort it's the it's the appropriate effort for mm. me to put in not the over efforting right and i say it's yeah. funny because i say the same things <laughs> to my students i said you would probably be very disappointed if you watched me practice at home you know, personally, my personal practice is probably like even more fundamental than a beginner's yoga class. But to your point is like, I, I'm going slow and I'm really concentrating. Do I really have Mula Banda? Am I really belly breathing? Am I really taking my time and like feeling like all the muscles working? And am I really correcting things? That's kind of a, that's kind of a thing I'm addressing in my classes these days is like working on correcting things, you know, so your, mm -hmm. your chin forward. Are you working on that when you come to class to, to do the posterior shift, the posterior mm -hmm. glide of your skull, or are you just in the habit of keeping your chin jutted forward? Mm -hmm. It's just like all those little things and who knows, just go slow enjoy the process now i've got one more question do you have a couple of extra minutes okay okay so I have all the time yeah okay <laughs> well i would I, I would like to address this because um i hope you know that in our yin yoga classes we have a posture that we call stobart's backbend did you know that mm -hmm. yes okay. i remember you that a couple of years ago and your students love it they do it's like believe me if we do a yin class and we skip stobart's backbend forget it i mean it's like torches and pitchforks come out <laughs> so you are michelle <laughs> stobart stobart's backbend is named after you can you tell the story do you remember the origin of how i started using uh, uh stobart's backbend do you remember Telling that story? Oh, gosh. Oh, okay. So I, I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot. Here. Is it? Say that. I'm sorry. Say one more time. I know you were here visiting, and I can't remember if you took a class with me or not. This was a story you shared, and we don't have to mention names or anything. All right. But this was a private client of yours a long time ago. It was a guy, and he was like really busted up. And about all he could do when he saw you privately was 
Stobart's back bend. Like you maybe even just rolled up a towel. I don't even know if he could fit on a bolster. He was really busted up. And you said, okay, let's at least try this. And do you remember, and you got him to, to lie on the, the, the towels or whatever, and you started to get him to like open his chest and drop his shoulders down in front. Is this sounding familiar to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was hoping you could just talk a little bit about where that gentleman started just by doing Stobart's backbend and what benefits he got from practicing that regularly. Okay. Well, so this particular client that you're talking about, um, he is a person who had a desk job. He also was a little, um, a little heavier and he also was a person who did a lot of golfing. So, you know, he kind of had the perfect storm of mm -hmm. the absolute opposite of that and was feeling a lot of strain and pain in his back, upper back and lower back because of all of that. And so, yeah, it was, again, kind of before yoga therapy was such a thing, mm -hmm. um, it was that idea of going, what are your movement patterns and how do we balance that? And where do we even start? If you're so, uh, if you're in so much pain, and if you're in a place where you don't even have the strength to start to do the kind of work that would put you there, mm -hmm. where do we, how do we deal with that? And so, yeah, that's where that pose came about. And I started having him do that. And really, your students have probably experienced this too. Uh, if they come into class and they're kind of collapsed over and in, just doing that, all of a sudden, they breathe more fully, they sit up a little taller, their posture is restored, and probably any nagging pain in their upper back, neck, and shoulders has subsided to some extent. And that was his experience, too. In just the one pose, the amount of pain that he felt himself in didn't diminish, but it, it, it dropped so that he could take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's and it was a real magic moment for him. It was and those kinds of things are real magic moments for me when we can find that one thing, even if it's just one thing, you know, and you spend half an hour, 40 minutes trying to go try this out, try right. this out, and then you get that one <laughs> thing. And you know, and for him, I, I still work with him sometimes actually. And um for him. It is about finding those things that balance his activity. I mean, that's really what my work is all about. When I work with people, I'm asking, I want to know about you. Tell me about you. Tell me about your life. Tell me what you do on a regular daily basis. What do you like to do to relax? What's your sleeping position? Because all of that says something about the way your body is habitually patterned for movement. And we want to then... I want to then apply poses, whether they're restorative based or active based, that help you to balance that. Because you're not going to change your sleep position. Mm -hmm. You're not going to change your job, you know, and that was true for this guy. Like he was on the retirement path. He's not going to change his job. <laughs> right. So his shoulder stops hurting, you know, he's not going to stop playing golf just so his low back stops hurting. And so it, it, the question is, how do we? how we use our yoga or our weight training or whatever it is that we apply, how do we use that to create the balance? And, and when you can figure out where the habitual movement patterns are, which is what I did with that guy, even applying one pose at the end of that pose, he could stand up and be balanced. Right. And it's not an opener. Like the moment that you as a student or as a teacher uh, have that one moment to breathe, to feel that softening or to witness that happen for someone else. It's a really magical moment. That's very cool. And yes, our clients love it and they do feel the benefit because it does like what we say uh, at Winter Garden Yoga, we try to undo what you do, right? So we're trying to undo the, the anterior head carriage, the anterior rolling and the forward flexion and i'm just going to repeat what you said as soon as you get on the bolster it completely 
reverses all of that for a good, you know, in yin yoga. So for a good five minutes, it just opens up the rib cage. It kind of gets the shoulder blades to pinch together and stuff and they love it. So thank you for that contribution to Winter Garden Yoga's toolbox. So your students are going to watch this and, and they're going to hear me say this and they're going to start saying, why don't you do this? <laughs> <laughs> dance or maybe I don't we'll see okay um, but because of that again I teach at six o'clock when people are coming out of their work and all of that I almost exclusively start my classes either just laying down on the floor with the feet on the floor yep. or laying in Stobart's back bend to undo the day yep. before we even ask anything else of the body yeah um, and and that's been a change for me over the last couple of years because normally you know we sit down cross-legged and try to lift the spine which is just impossible right um, right off the bat so i've been starting all my classes in that in that format to help the students embody and balance and then that gives us a place a nice foundation to start from where there is a little more balance to um to get more actually to get more benefit out of the practice itself yeah. Well, it gives the spine a chance to kind of rest and reset a little bit. Yeah. And the breathing. Uh, this could be a whole other topic for discussion <laughs> next time. But you know, it's really breathing is so crucial. Proper breathing because yeah. of the biomechanical effect it has on the nervous system. You can relax, truly relax instantly. Muscle spasms, muscle tension just kind of backs off. And that can help prepare you to become more mobile. And then you start to get more into like the, the asana after that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, sure. That's great. Awesome. So how can people find out about you? Where can they find you on the internet, et cetera? Okay. Yeah, they can. Um, I have very limited, I don't do all the crazy, but um, so they can visit my website, which is inhaleyoga.org. Um, it talks about what I do at the studio, my classes. Also, they would find on there, I filmed two DVDs. So one is a yin and restorative base practice that has Stobart's back bend in it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, the other is a therapeutic flow practice, which is um, a movement-based practice in, in, uh, embodying the, um, not necessarily the placement of your body, but the engagement. Of your body to use it in a way that creates greater strength and stability while um, looking at range of motion so they can find that on there also the studio has a facebook page inhale yoga studio um, and uh yeah i guess all my other contact information is on the uh is on the website i don't do instagram and twitter and <laughs> my time doing things that don't involve being in front of technology that long. I gotcha. That's awesome. Well, great. And just a little side note, um, for what it's worth, Michelle Stobart is truly like one of a handful of yoga teachers that I trust and refer people to if they're in the Athens, Ohio area. If you're not in the Athens, Ohio area and you want to check out how Michelle teaches, check out her uh, video downloads that you can get on her website. They're filmed in a Japanese garden. What's the name of the Japanese garden? The, oh, on the DVD? Yeah, on the DVD. Uh, it's um, Schnormeyer Gardens. Oh, it's beautiful there. There, yeah. So it's like really nice background. Uh, the voiceover, it's a very high quality well done session. So if you can't make it to um, Athens, Ohio, at least make try to make it to the to Michelle's website and get the DVDs. They're they're really very good. That's it yeah. for this episode. Oh yes. I was gonna say and and if oh, and two things. Yes. One inhale yoga studio has a YouTube channel which I put a lot of tips, techniques, and tricks um, for getting more out of your practice or pranayama or whatever. So you can subscribe to that. Um, and then the other thing is if you check those things out and you think, hey, this girl knows what she's doing. I'd really love to study with her, but there's no way I'm getting to Athens. 
talk to Winter Garden Yoga about having me over <laughs> to do some workshops. <laughs> we can do that. We can definitely talk about that. That'd be awesome. I didn't even know about your YouTube yeah, love- channel. I'm going to subscribe. Yeah. Well, you might find yourself on that YouTube channel, actually. I think, uh, I think there is perhaps a video of you teaching how to do crow pose to teach your trainees years ago. I remember that. Yeah. All right, cool. I'll look for that. Thank you for having me on your channel. That's <laughs> sure. awesome. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks again, Michelle. And check out inhaleyoga.org. Inhaleyoga.org. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.